One, two, one, two. What is happening? Revolution World. This is TK Coleman, and you're tuning in to the Revolution Will Be live stream. Remember, every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, except for today, days like today where we have technical difficulties, we're coming at you live. 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Tuesdays and Thursdays, TK's Two Cents, where I take a couple of tweets and I riff on the story or the context behind those tweets. And on Wednesdays, Kamau and I have a special guest. We talk about what's going on in the world and how to apply big ideas into everyday life. I'm really excited about today's guest. Uh, I met today's guest at a Students for Liberty conference several years ago, and he may not remember this, but at that time, uh, I consulted him for some advice. I was going through some challenging times in my life. And one of the things that I was most impressed with about him is the compassion and the empathy behind the philosophical substance that he provides. I have always said that you can um, really create a lot of opportunities in life if you can just develop the ability to answer people's questions without getting mad at them for asking or without being confused by the question itself. And there are fewer people I've met that are as good at that as the one and only, the inimitable Larry Sharp. Larry Sharp ran for governor in the state of New York. Um, he went on the Joe Rogan show during his campaign. And if you watch that, you will see a quintessential example of a person that knows how to hold his own in a space where voluntarist ideas are just clearly counterintuitive. Um, and that was quite the interview to watch. Maybe we will chat about that, who knows. But uh, Larry ran for governor of New York and he is also a, um, a highly successful entrepreneur and one of the best voices today. <laughs> one of the best voice, voices today for the freedom philosophy. So I'm happy to have you on the show. Larry, welcome to the live stream. Thank you so much for having me, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. So, you know, as you heard me say about you in that intro, um, I really love the way you can navigate a lot of these tough, highly sensitive issues. I heard Ravi Zacharias say one time that we should try to have discussions where we shed more light than heat. And there are fewer people who do that as well as you. So one question Thank I want to have, one question I want to ask you just to lead off is, how did you become that way? And how can we have conversations about what's happening in America right now without resorting to all of the standard mudslinging, you know, between left and right? Number one issue to remember, number one, is that most of us want the same outcome. That's the number one thing to do. Focus not on the way to get there, focus on the outcome that we want, right? Uh, recently, if you've been watching the Democrats, Republicans talk about schools. Democrats are talking about funding schools more, Republicans are talking about school choice. If you start with school choice or funding schools, you're fighting because those are methods to get the same thing, right? What we should start the conversation with is, do you want better schools? You do. Let's have a conversation. So always start with the common goal at the heart of it. If you start with that, not the method, if you start by default, my method is the right method and by default you're evil, how can you have a conversation? You can't. If you look currently at our environment, the way our political environment works now, but not just politically, even socially in many ways, we're not united by common goals. We're united by common enemies. Who do you hate? I hate them too. Therefore, we're together. Do we believe in anything together? No, not at all. We just hate these people. So now we unite. This is a defensive posture that most people have in, 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 in I guess, the, the idea is it, desperate times. Desperate times means we fall to be defensive and we unite by behind common enemies. I don't want to unite behind a common enemy. One of the most one of the most common reasons why my fellow libertarians get angry at me is not because of my policy. It's because I won't hate the people they want me to hate. Right? They want me to hate this group. They want me to hate that group. I don't want to fight the left. I don't want to fight the right. I want to unite them all. I'm greedy. I want all of them. I want every single one. I am totally greedy. I want all of them, every one of them. So I don't want, I can't, I can't turn you if I can't talk to you. One of my heroes is Daryl Davis. You may know Daryl Davis. He's a musician, I think out of Missouri. I'm not sure, but he's a musician. And he literally took his time to, to, to hang out with members of the KKK 
so he can convert them to be his friend. And he has like two dozen or something. I forgot how many he has. And he keeps their hoods as trophies. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Imagine if we had 100,000 of him in this country. We'd have a better country in 10 years. We'd have a magical country in 20. That's what I want. Now, Larry, what, one of the the concerns I see a lot of people express when it comes to that that very thing you're saying is a lot of people are are very uncharitable in, in, in how they interpret the things you say. And yep. some people, they lead the discussion with you're a bootlicker or you're a, you're a bigot or yep. you're just the socialist that wants to take my money and my guns. Like when yep. somebody starts the conversation by putting you on the defense, uh, how, how, how do you judo your way out yeah. of that into doing what you're talking about? And this becomes a very important understanding. And it's understanding of human nature. You were talking about empathy earlier, right? Empathy is all about emotional intelligence. And this is not an easy thing to do at all. It takes years of practice of doing it. But recognize something. The reason, the, the, the reason why people are angry, two reasons. One, either there's a perception of a lack of control or a perception of a lack of respect. That's it. That's why we're angry. If if we don't have those two things, we're something else. Disappointed, disgusted, insert word here. But when you're angry, it's because there is a perceived lack of respect or a perceived lack of control. And the key word in those two phrases is perceived. It doesn't have to be real. When it comes to anger, reality has very little bearing. Let me say that one more time because people don't always get that. When it comes to anger, reality has very little bearing. I'm mad. Well, let me explain why you're an asshole. I'm still mad. Reality hasn't changed the fact that I'm still mad, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It is emotional. So when someone comes at you who's angry, they either feel like you don't respect them or someone doesn't respect them or they feel like they're not in control. Give them respect and control and their anger level comes down. Not just that. What's the root of aggression? Fear. People are aggressive because they're afraid. You're going to take something away from me, make me change, whatever. So I act aggressively. So if I instead say, I'm not taking anything. Just don't take this guy's stuff. You can keep your stuff. Just don't take mine. You can keep your stuff. Just don't take his. All of a sudden, they begin to have a conversation. But it's the second piece that that's the first piece. The piece is understanding that emotion first, then logic. All human beings are both emotional and logic. There is no exception to that rule. And almost every time I speak, I talk about rules that are maybe kind of general rules. This is a 100% rule. All human beings are both emotional and logic. Some more logical than emotional, some emotional mod logical. Depends on where you are in your life. You're having failures in your life. You tend to be more emotional. You're having successes in your life. You tend to be more logical. And of course, your own personality. All those things come into play, but we're all both. Deal with the emotion first, then the logic, which means it's at least a two or three step process to communicating. People don't want that. Human nature says, I want to be right and I want to be right right now. That's it. But the savviest people know that you can be right later. It's really okay if you're right later. So take your time in communicating. You'll have longer conversations, but you'll have less of them and they'll be more impactful. The communication that you and I had, it was impactful. It was longer. I took time out of my day to chat with you. It was a longer conversation, but it was impactful. Practice, do that and things will change. You mentioned Davis uh, earlier and how he talked with people from the KKK and, and keeps the, 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 the hood as a souvenir. What's your favorite story from your personal life where maybe you went into an unconventional space where people were supposed to reject you and by applying these principles of communication, you were able to win somebody over? I'll tell you one that was recently. This is uh, earlier this year or last year. I think, it was, I think it was late last year. I was crossing the state and I was trying to, I, I crossed New York State, all 62 counties every year. I'm doing it again, starting um, in about two weeks. I'm doing it again across state yet again. And I'm at a libertarian event and there's a young lady there. I'm guessing 19 or so in that area. And she says, and it's a libertarian event. She says, you know, Larry, I think I'm a communist. And of course, the first thing I do is like, back off, don't attack her. Libertarians want to attack her. I have to back off, back <laughs> off. I got this, relax. So the libertarians back off. And what I ask her is, oh, okay. Um, can I assume you're a communist because you want things to be fair? 
And I use that word fair. The reason why I say fair is because generally speaking, people who lean right care about being righteous. People who lean left care about being good. The reality of it is neither of those is necessarily a good thing. Good intentions often create bad stuff. Righteousness often creates bad stuff. So what I say is the word fair. And most people say, yeah, I do. Because if you're righteous, you think you're fair. If you're good, you think you're fair. So I use the word fair so that you'll agree with me because you want to be fair. And they go, yeah, I do want to be fair. Awesome. That's great. So as I said that, she then began to go, oh, you're not against me. I use the emotional piece first. I found a common goal. Do we all want to be fair? Yes, we do. Okay. Now she at least will hear me. She said, mm -hmm. I think I'm a communist on purpose. She was prepared to fight. I didn't want to fight. If you don't want to fight, the best thing you can do is instead of putting your dukes up, bring them down. If you want to disarm your opponent, disarm yourself first, right? This, this concept is called burying your throat, right? If you bury your throat in a public arena, the people who are after you see it as an, as an, uh, an opportunity and they attack. Great. Now you know who your bad guys are. The people who don't care go, oh, whatever, and go back on their phones. And the people who love you go, Larry, what are you doing? Put your throat down. You, if you bear your throat, you will all of a sudden see who's on your side, right? You, it's, 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 it can be, uh, it, it can be uh, dangerous in a way, but only socially. And if you are confident in yourself and not concerned about the social damage, you just do it. And now you'll know who your friends are, who your enemies are, and who really doesn't care. But in any case, I started that. As I began to talk with her, I said, so if I, if I understand, you want everything to be fair. So for example, you think, say, everyone should have like a one bedroom house like that. She was exactly, we should all have like a one bedroom house. That would be great. I said, that would be great. I would love that. That'd be amazing. I'm, I'm happy we agree with that. I said, I gotta ask a question. Let's say we all have a one bedroom house, but this guy, and it was a guy next to me, but this guy, he has no kids. I got three. Ugh, that's a problem, isn't it? She's like, yeah, it's a problem. I said, what are we gonna do? She said, well, you should get a bigger house. I said, great, but how are we gonna do that? What if I, what if I should get his house too? How about that? Well, he should give it. What if he doesn't want to? Um, I said, can I tell you what usually happens in communist and socialist societies? She said, what? I said, every time men in uniform and weapons come and make things happen. That's what happens. Whether it was Roman times, men in Roman, Roman uniforms with swords, or today, men with badges and guns. It doesn't matter. It's usually men, women too nowadays. Back through time, it's always been men. But now women too. It's equal opportunity enforcement. The people will actually come with badges and uniforms and weapons, and they will take it. Are you okay with that? She said, no. I said, me either. I said, socialism can work really well if you're okay with constant and consistent state-sponsored violence. Are you okay with that? She went, no, not at all. I said, me either. I said, wouldn't it be better if we had a way that we could have an environment where people could have a one-bedroom house when they want one, and a two-bedroom house when they want one, or an apartment when they want one? When people could get what they wanted as their life changes, they could get what they wanted? She goes, yeah. I said, me too. I think liberty is probably a better way of making that happen. And all she said to me at the end of that conversation was, you know, maybe I'm not a communist. That's a win. That's a win. Doesn't mean she's going to vote for me. Doesn't mean she's libertarian now. Doesn't mean she's not going to go to ANCAP tomorrow. Doesn't mean any of that stuff. But it means she thought, you know what? Maybe there's a better way. And it also made her realize that we do have something in common. We want things to be fair. I would love everyone to have the house they want when they want it. That'd be amazing. Yeah. I guess one of the one of the attitudes you need to apply that kind of mindset is the willingness to accept those small victories. Sometimes yes. we're, we're pretty all or nothing about it. And, and if you don't convert over to the religion, if you don't say the sinner's prayer, whatever the libertarian sinner's prayer is, you know, um, then it's like, oh, it doesn't count. You know, right. um, yes. but, but you got to learn how to be happy with just scoring a point. You didn't win the game, but you scored a point. And, and the next thing to remember is not everybody wants to be free. I mean, mm. that's the critical thing to understand. We spend so much time in the liberty movement talking about liberty and freedom, liberty and freedom. It's not about liberty and freedom. That's, that's not true. That's a mistake we've been making for 40 years. We tell ourselves this story and we're fooling ourselves. I hear all the time, everybody wants liberty and freedom. No, they don't. There's zero evidence of that. I don't know why you would, we've made this up. It's a story we've told ourselves this so many times that we now believe it because we've said it so many times. 
Lots of people don't want to be free, and that's okay. The reality of it is our movement isn't really about liberty and freedom. Well, the failed ones are, but the real ones aren't about that. They, they're about happiness. Liberty and freedom is the right way to happiness. Liberty and freedom is a means to an end, right? The end is people being happy. And I, look, what could I give everyone who's watching you right now? What could I give you right now? One thing that would make everybody watching and listening happy now and 10 years from now. And the answer is nothing. There is no way I could do that because what you want now will change 10 years from now, right? You're a different person. 10 years ago, you were a different person, right? You wanted different things 10 years ago and you want now. You'll want different things 10 years from now. You will want different things, whatever those things are. Not just that, what Jane wants, Bob doesn't. What Phil what doesn't want, whatever. Someone else doesn't want, it's, it's different things. So what can I do? I can make an environment to where you can chase your happiness to the best of your ability any way you see fit. Will you fail sometimes? Yes, and you own your life and you own those failures. Will you get happiness and then will it go away from you? Will you lose it? Yes. Life is a series of joy and pain in between boredom. That's what life is, right? We hope there's more joy than pain and less, boy and less boredom. That's how it works. And that's what we'll deal with. So since me and my magic powers can't do it, nothing can. That's why our, our founding documents, our divorce papers from the UK, don't say life, liberty, and happiness. They say life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's what it's about, us pursuing our happiness, whatever that might be now or 10 years from now. My goal as any good leader, government or otherwise, is to allow the people around me to have the best environment for them to find happiness. That's what I'm trying to achieve, not trying to control you, rule you. And sometimes people don't want to be free and libertarians get crazy. What do you mean voluntary detention? That's stupid. Yeah, it's called the Marine Corps. I joined. I voluntarily signed my rights away. It's called giving your money to a civic association, a church group. That's voluntarily socialism. You can do it if you want to, but you can stop. You can say, no, I'm no longer enlisted. I, I ended my contract. People put themselves in rehab. That's literally putting yourself in jail. People do it all the time. It's what they want to do at their given time. People act communism within their own families that they want to, communistic, but they volunteer. They do it because they choose to. There's nothing wrong with you doing it as long as people volunteer and you can stop it if you don't want to do it anymore. And you know what? Maybe that that time when a commune was good for you. Maybe that's what you wanted at the time when you ran off to join the kibbutz in Israel. Good for you, man, That if that's your thing. Maybe you want to live with the Amish for five years. Good on you. And maybe you don't. But either way, I don't judge that. You do. Larry, let's talk about voting. One of the things you said on the Joe Rogan show is that if you could have a completely voluntary society, that's your true north. You'll take it. I would. And that's that's where, that's where you and I are lock and step. You know, like you're a man after my own heart. But I also know that you believe in incremental progress and your your run for governor was an effort towards that. So I can mm -hmm. only assume that you're not against voting, but I know in in the libertarian world you have the minarchist anarchist debate. There are many people who say let's opt out of this system of coercion. It's a complete fraud. It's a complete waste. There are some who say, no, no, no. Like if we go about it in this particular way, we can get somewhere. What's your official stance on voting? Should people vote? Should everyone vote? Is there anyone who should not vote? What's your take? Yeah, um, it is my opinion that people who don't want to vote um, are hurting themselves. You don't have to vote. It's not mandatory and it shouldn't be mandatory, but it's your right. And I think you, I think you should vote. Why? And I hear it all the time. These idiots, uh, I don't want to vote. It's a bad system. Right. But they're voting your rights away. They don't. And it's my, they don't have a God gave me my rights or the Constitution gave me my rights. I don't care where you think your rights come from. It's irrelevant. I don't care. And it, and it makes me angry when I say that, but I don't. Because here's the reality. Wherever your rights come from, they are only guaranteed by your society. And that drives libertarians crazy. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. I own my house. You only own your house if your society says you do. If it doesn't, they will take your house. If you fight, they will kill you and take your house. You only own your house if your society tells you that you own your house. If you disagree, they will kill you and take your house. How many thousands upon thousands of times have we seen that to be true? Again and again and again. There is zero evidence ever throughout history of humanity 
to where that not being true. The way you can control your society is two ways. The, 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 uh, the ammunition box or the ballot box, both work. You can resort to violence or you can vote. I choose voting. But either way can work. I mean, sitting out and saying, I'm not going to, I'm going to opt out. That's great. You don't have to care about your government. Your government cares about you. You don't have to care about society. Your society cares about you. So you have two choices. You can use violence. I don't like that. I don't want to do that. Or you can vote. I choose voting. All right. So let's talk about this. Let me push back a little bit. This whole Please. lesser of two evil thing. Most people who talk about voting, everyone says, get out there and vote. Get out there and vote. And, and, and what I think the majority of those people really mean is, hey, let's work together to stop this person I don't want to win. Correct. From getting into yep. right? If, yes, if the people correct. that are voting, if the people that are voting Biden, when they say go vote, if I say, OK, I'm going to go vote for Trump, they'll immediately want me to stay at home. And if the people correct. that are voting for Trump they go out there and vote and I say, OK, how about Biden? They'll, they'll want me to stay at home. So I, I, at first, I think most people are disingenuous when they say that. But. Absolutely. Good idea, I, I, you know, I love Killer people, Mike. Hold on. I love Killer Mike. Yeah. But Killer Mike said the death of George Floyd, the idea now is to, you know, to 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 uh, organize and plan and strategize. That's what he said. That sounds amazing. What he meant was vote Democrat. That's not the answer. If he actually meant organize to build our communities, if he actually meant strategize to find real answers without government, I'd be on board. That's what he said, but it's to your point. That sounds amazing. What he actually means is vote Biden. That's what he actually yeah, means. And, vote Democrat. And, You're and totally I'm, correct. I'm really I agree with you. Upset. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm totally not down with that, right? I'm totally not down with buying into the leftist rhetoric that, oh, this is the party that has my best interest in mind because I'm black. But I'm also not down with the philosophy of thinking that I've taken the red pill just because I sleep on the right side of the bed, if you know what I mean, right? Like I want to be fully woke. I don't want to be in bed with the state. And and so this idea of like, oh, let's vote the lesser of two evils. At least it's not Hillary. At least it's not Biden. At least it's not Trump. Aren't we just telling this system that you can just give me more of the same and I'll be happy with the terrible option as long as it's the lesser of two evils? My example of this is if there were two serial killers running for president, one of them killed 16 people and the other killed eight, people would vote for the serial killer and they would say, well, at least he only killed eight people. That, that's what I honestly believe most Americans I, would no, do. I'm, I know not, I'm not fighting you at all. I'm agreeing with you, which is why I don't vote Democrat or Republican. If more people will vote third party, look, I, I don't want you to vote anything other than libertarian, right? Clearly, I'm biased, right? Clearly. With that in mind, if you're not going to vote Libertarian, please don't vote Democrat Republican. Vote any other third party. I don't care which one, any other third party, because what you're saying is exactly true. The way we break the left right paradigm is by voting, but not with the left right paradigm. That's how you do it. Now, some people who are watching are Democrats, some are Republicans. I get it. And they're never going to become Libertarians. Okay. But imagine if you just voted Libertarian, say, for example, this race or any other race. If a bunch of people voted Libertarian, what would happen? Right now, and I use this specifically for the black community, Democrats show up every two to four years and pretend they love us because they have to for votes. Then they do nothing except use the government to enforce their will upon us and to make us worse and to make us their slaves. And I mean that obviously not literally figuratively, right? Bill Clinton was the first black president and he threw 150,000 cops in the black neighborhoods and put us in jail at record, at record amounts. That's the first black president. I'm using my air quotes, yes. Right, that's what Democrats do. So they can do whatever they want, crush us, put us in jail, attack us, and we'll keep voting for them. So they ignore us except every two or four years because they know their vote, the vote is guaranteed for them at 90% or more, usually 95% or more usually. Republicans ignore us too. Why bother? We're not gonna vote for them. So they don't care. They, they, they throw their black friend up once in a while to say, see, we're not totally racist. That's what they do to make people believe that and feel good that they actually care, right? They don't care either. Democrats, Republicans are no more or less racist than anybody else. They're all the same. But Republicans have the image of they're racist. That's the image. So here's our black friend. We have one of them. Here we go. And then to be forward, 
Democrats only have one black friend also. Just when they do an event, they bring all of them together. But same thing, same same concept. Then the Republican says that and then just goes off and says, we're going to ignore you because you're not going to vote for us anyway. But imagine if instead a bunch of people voted Libertarian. What would happen? Democrats would go, whoa, that vote is not guaranteed anymore. I might actually have to do something for that community and or I might have to be more Libertarian. Otherwise, I might lose those votes or Libertarians might gain those votes. Republicans would say, whoa, there's a, they won't automatically vote Democrat. I could get those votes. Oh my God, I should actually care about this. Would that happen if it happened one time? Probably not. Two or three. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. Vote third party two or three times. Any block, women, Asians, African-Americans. I'm sorry, I'm black. I still say black. Black America, right? Whatever the case, I'm hoping that I'm, I'm, I'm not making people angry by saying that. Um, but whatever it might be, any block, if any block vote that usually votes a certain way would turn for two or three elections to vote third party, you would have better Democrats and better Republicans. The reason why it's, it's, it's 16 dead versus eight dead is for this reason. In a bipolar world where there's only one option, all I have to do is go, that guy's bad. I'm not him. That's my entire campaign. And it works because there's no other option but me. But once it's a third party and I go, that guy's bad, you go, okay, well, who else is there? It doesn't automatically come to me. So I actually have to have a policy. I have to have an answer. As a third party, I learned this running in New York. When I run in New York State, I had to actually have policies for everything because I'm third party. If, if, if I, Cuomo, who I was running against, his entire campaign was, I'm not Trump. And Trump wasn't running for governor. It wasn't even a presidential election. And his entire campaign was, I'm not Trump. The Republicans' campaign was, I'm not Cuomo. That was their entire campaign. They had no actual policies. I would ask you now, can you think about right now in today's election, can you think of an actual Trump or Biden policy? Thank you. You can't. Most people can't. All they can think of is I have to vote for Trump because what you just said was exactly right. Otherwise, the socialists will take over the world or I have to vote for Biden. Otherwise, Trump will eat our babies. Right. So either one of the reasons why we have to vote, it's not because either is going to help us. And the reality is they're not going to. You know what they're going to say, though, Larry, you, you know, you know where I'm going with this next question. But if you vote for a third party. Yep. It's a waste of vote, right? It kind of it's kind of like the, the prisoner's dilemma where the choice you make is based on what you think the other guy is going to do. And we've seen this story play out over and over and over again. Is there yep. really any rational basis for thinking that there will ever be enough people to deviate from that binary way of thinking. Yes, and let me cover many pieces of this. The first piece I'm gonna look at, look at most states now, look at even most counties now. They're gerrymandered so much that it's always going to be the same party winning. Many times you find people run six, seven, eight times in a row unopposed. No one runs. That's a wasted vote. I live in New York State. If you vote for Biden or Trump, your vote is wasted. Why? Biden's going to win New York State. I don't care what you do. We are three to one Democrat to Republican. Biden wins New York State. I don't know if he's going to win the election. I don't know if Trump's going to win. Biden, I don't know. New York State, Trump's not winning it. If you're a Republican in New York State and you vote for Trump, you are throwing your vote away. It's going to Biden. Done. If you vote for Biden, you are throwing your vote away. For every one of you doesn't vote, there's two who will vote for Biden. Biden's winning New York. That's a wasted vote. Eventually, people are going to figure that out and start voting third party. And again, third party does not have to have a majority. Imagine this for a second. In New York State, I use New York State as an example, but this could be any city, any state. Our Senate is kind of equal-ish, right? As a Republicans, Democrats. If there were just, say, five libertarians, just five, we'd be the swing vote. We control the Senate with five libertarians in the entire state at a state Senate level. Imagine that in our national Congress, in our, in our Senate. Imagine if there were 10 libertarians in the Senate, five libertarians in the Senate. We would control the Senate by default because we're a swing vote. So yes, it could happen. It's not going to happen tomorrow, 
But can it happen? Sure. The system actually is set up to collapse upon itself. And it is, right? But I'll go one step further. November 2020 or December, whenever we figure out who wins the presidency after the mail-in votes or whatever happens, whatever happens, you're going to have a whole lot of unhappy people. You're going to have tens of millions of unhappy Americans. It doesn't matter who wins. If Trump wins, you got tens of million Biden supporters who say, the Russians did it, right? Guaranteed. If Trump, if, if Trump loses, you got tens of millions of Trump supporters going, it was rigged. Either way, you're going to have tens of millions of people angry about the system. And, and you're going to have, and it's maybe sound horrible, sporadic violence. Because people are either going to check out or resort to violence. That's going to happen. There, there will be sporadic violence in December and, and January. That's a guarantee. I'll put money on it. It will happen. Guaranteed. It won't be organized. It won't be anything massive. It'll be sporadic. People just mad, upset, doing violent things because they're going to be desperate and think the world's ending because they've been taught that Satan is on the opposite side and Satan has just won. They're going to believe that, right? And regardless of who wins, they will think Satan is the one who's who's won. So they're going to be fighting. Where are they going to go? If there's no third party, the answer is more violence or checking out. But if there's a third party, there's a place to go for those people. The most zealous are the converted. Let's convert them. It will be the most zealots that we have. This is why third party matters. So yes, it can absolutely work. It will take time. It will take energy. We can dominate a state or a city if we just have enough libertarians to be the swing vote. It absolutely can happen. But here's the most important piece. Even if we just become five or 10% of any legislature, any assembly, any deliberative body at all, by default, you will have better Democrats and better Republicans. Do I want the world of libertarian? Yes. But would I take better Democrats and better Republicans? Yeah, I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that as a stepping stone to the future. You don't all have to become libertarian tomorrow. Please become libertarian tomorrow. But you don't have to become libertarian tomorrow. You can all just become better Democrats and better Republicans. Right now, you don't have that. We purposefully create wedge issues that are, sol- that are totally solvable so we can fight each other. Mail-in voting is a wedge issue. It shouldn't be. It could be solved. Are there problems? Yes. Both sides have valid arguments to it. There are problems. And we didn't even try to solve them. Why would you when you can make it a wedge issue? Why would you solve it when you go, are you for mail-in voting? I am. Oh, you're a Democrat. Are you for mail-in voting? I'm not. Oh, you're a Republican. Why would I bother fixing it? Are you telling me that we didn't figure out COVID three, six months ago, whatever it was, when things were going to be bad, we couldn't have literally said, you know what, this is going to be a problem. Why don't we take that $8 billion it'll cost us to fix the post office system and instead take a chunk of that and give it to an auditing company like KPMG, whose job it is to audit things, who will be sued and will go to jail if they don't order it correctly, who will literally audit the lottery system for billions of dollars across the country and have them oversee uh, a conglomerate of, say, FedEx and UPS and uh, DHL to create a secure, safe system. Amazon that can track a package, you know, and know what street it's on, right? To oversee that, to make sure there's no fraud in our voting. Could that have been done? Yes. Was it done? No. Why would you fix that problem? Why would you? It's a wedge issue. That's what we're up against. But if you have libertarians in charge, we would have actually solved that problem. We would have been able to solve that problem, wedge issue taken care of. Immigration, wedge issue. You can't fix immigration? Of course you can. You don't want to. You don't want to. This is my issue. Larry, We've was thrown there the L word out. Go ahead. Go. Go ahead. Uh, Larry, was there a life before politics for you? What, what, before you kind of dove in to kind of your current state, you know, what did life look like before you? Where, how did you, you know, bear your throat to others and unite people before politics? Um, I was a business guy, I still am, right? I've been an officer in a public company twice. Um, so I know how to run organizations, it's what I do. Um, I train, I teach, I've taught at, at, at colleges for years. I taught at Yale and Columbia years ago, I taught at Baruch College as early as last year, John Jay College. I, I was, I'm, a, I'm a trainer, a teacher, an educator, and a leader. That's what I do. Larry, I, I want to I talk more about libertarianism because we, we've kind of been talking like people might know what that word means, but, but libertarianism is sort of like the, the well-kept secret. 
in, in political thinking. Um, and you know me that I'm, I'm really passionate about the, the challenges and concerns that are unique to black communities in this country. And it's interesting to me because whenever there are discussions on these topics, it's almost just sort of assumed that if you care yep. at all about problems in black communities, you must be advocating for socialism. And the, the association between voluntarism and concerns in black communities, it's not even made. And so I would love to hear you, for people that are listening that aren't familiar, I love to hear you just kind of break down, give a brief primer. What is libertarianism? And how can it offer viable solutions and insights to the, the concerns and challenges of black communities that just go beyond, oh, don't worry about it, you know, don't involve the government? Several things. Um, I, could, I could talk for six hours, but I won't punish you. Uh, the first piece I'll bring up is the, the idea of libertarianism is, is actually simple in, at its core. It is you can be as liberal as you want to be as conservative as you want to be, just don't force your view upon others. If you say to yourself, I'm super conservative, Mr. Conservative, that's awesome. Do you believe it is the government's job to enforce your will, to create a more conservative environment and to make others become more conservative? If you say yes, you are Republican. If you say no, it's not the government's job, it's my job through my works, through my example, through my community, right? That's what will make society more conservative. You're a libertarian. If you say, I'm super liberal, everybody should be liberal. Okay, great. Do you think it's the government's job to enforce uh, a more liberal society, to make uh, the world more liberal, to enforce your will upon others? If you go, yes, you're a Democrat. If you say, no, it is through me, through my works, through my example, through my community, to encourage people to be more liberal. We should all be more liberal. You're a libertarian. That's really what it's about. That's the distinction. Are you prepared to force people to do it? I say all the time, if you remember any of my policies, I'm not an abolish guy, not who I am. You never even go abolish this, abolish that. I'm not one of those guys because remember something, government by default is two things. It is a monopoly, it is a jobs program. And libertarians just don't understand that. They just say, it's evil, get rid of it. Silly thought process. It is a monopoly and a jobs program. What does that mean? The second you abolish government, there's nothing there because it's a monopoly. When you add government, you by default remove community. That's how it works. Communities can't function without government when you add too much government. If you remove government, there's nothing left. Community can't step in yet. There's, there's, no, there's no primer for it. It doesn't work. Second, it's a jobs program. You just laid off a bunch of people using a poor community. That's not going to work. So what do I always do? If you remember my policies, government exists. Let me now encourage and show and give an opportunity for something other than government to exist. I break the monopoly of government. And I say to everyone who is a socialist, I say, allow this to exist. If I'm wrong and my ideas are bad, people will stay with government. It's still there. But if I'm right, and I believe I am, people will leave that and go to that and government will wither on its own, which I'm okay with. And I believe that will happen. So that's what libertarianism is actually about, creating community over government, allowing people to support each other. Because here's the number one thing. When someone has a problem, whatever problem it is, financial, um, medical, um, emotional, whatever problem is, the first thing they need is not a program. The first thing they need is someone who cares. If you get someone who cares, then that person will help you find whatever you need. Government can't care. Government can check a box and provide services. That's what it can do. People can care. Communities can care. And that's what I want to achieve. So I'm trying to move more towards that. Now, how does that work specifically in black and brown communities, immigrant communities? But I'll talk about the black community specifically. There is a difference between the black community and other communities. And people don't get it. I hear all the time, well, the Irish came and how come they got over it? Well, the Irish were slaves. And I hear that all the time. And what about the Italians and Jews? And what about, I hear that all the time. There is a difference. None of those groups, as they came here and absolutely struggled and fought through issues and concerns and fought through bigotry and prejudice, 100% they all did. That's 100% true. And they should all be given kudos for doing that. The one thing they didn't have is hundreds of years of state-sponsored violence against them. The black community had that. Hundreds 
of years of state-sponsored violence against them. As the black community began to grow on its own, the government literally came by and burned and destroyed the communities that the, that the black communities built. If you look as early as the 1860s and 70s, when the, when the plantation owners left the areas that they, that they had, the 40 acres and the mule idea was slaves who used to be on those plantations now got that land to work their own. The mules that the army had used were no longer necessary because the war was over, so they could either put them down or give them away. They give them away to the slaves, the, the former slaves. Not a bad idea. Who gets punished? Well, not the poor whites. They didn't own slaves. Who got punished? The wealthy whites who owned slave plantation owners. They got punished. Fair. Sounds great. The people who they used to, to do that get the land. Amazing. What happened? Andrew Johnson says, no, we're going to change that after Lincoln's assassinated and says, send the army in to remove the blacks. I'm not making that up. That's history. So state sponsored violence from that day. As black communities began to grow on their own, segregated. Now, Killer Mike, I love Killer Mike. One thing he brought up, which was which was interesting, it's a it's a it's a controversial statement, but he actually said something. He said there was an advantage to segregation. He said the advantage of segregation was you had to have black owned businesses because you couldn't go to white ones. That's I mean, that's that that's that's a horrible thing to say, but that was happening. There were black owned businesses. There were uh, what? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Remember that? Right? Black Wall Street came in. And this, again, people don't realize that was government sponsored violence. That wasn't random white people trying to kill black people. How they make it sound? It wasn't. They sent the National Guard in. Cops came in with bags and guns. That was state sponsored violence. The only group of people who even came close to that are Native Americans. They had it too. And, and they're in trouble also. They're also, if you've seen them on reservations, they're in trouble also. If you're a group that had hundreds of years of state-sponsored violence, how can you, every time you grow yourself, get crushed? After World War I, black veterans come back from World War I saying, I fought in this country, for this country, and over in Europe, I'm ready to go. That was one of the heights of racism in the United States. Why? Because black men came back and they wanted to vote. Of course they would. They would just they would serve the country. They want to come back and vote. Nope. That's what that's when the KKK marches in um in uh in DC, Black Wall Street, two years after the, the vets come back. Yeah, that's when it happened. That's where gun control comes from. Keeping peeking guns out of black people's hands. But all these things begin to fall upon themselves because they're bad policies. After that, black people start trying to grow. A after World War II, same thing. Blacks serve in, in the military, they come back, but they want to take advantage of all the housing. Remember all the housing boom? There were government, federal government laws that said you could not have black families in houses. They had a percentage of 30% could be Irish or Jewish or Italian, zero black. Can't get a mortgage. The state sponsors the violence. So finally, the 50s and 60s come and the black population says, you've been literally state sponsored violence against us for 100 years, fine, we'll play your game. We'll use the law against you. We'll do it. We'll use the law. We won't be libertarian, which we have been. Malcolm X was libertarian, right? We're not going to be libertarian anymore because every time we do it, you literally use the government to destroy us, to physically, you make laws in the South so that we can't integrate. Now, this is what I'm saying for people who don't understand this. Humans aren't that racist. We just aren't. We're tribal. We absolutely are tribal as humans, but we're not naturally racist. It's not true. We're tribal. We'll make tribes on anything. We'll make tribes on baseball teams. We'll make tribes on what city we grow up in. We'll make tribes on anything. Music we like. We, we, we're not we're not racial tribal. That's not what we do. Freaking uh, uh, Shakespeare had 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 black people in his plays four hundred years ago, right? It's just not who we are. Government makes us racist. Institutions make us racist. That's what I mean when I say institutional racism. I mean in the sixteen hundreds. When after the, the Bacon Rebellion, they make a distinction between white and black slaves. White slaves are contractual. Black slaves are forever. They are now chattel. First time ever the children of slaves became slaves by default. You were a slave because you were black, not because of an agreement, not because of a war, not because you were captured, because you were black. Government did that. Humans never thought that before. Ancient Romans had slaves. Egyptians had slaves. Lots of people had slaves. 
but you were enslaved because you lost the war or you made the king angry or whatever was the social rule of the day. But your children weren't slaves. They didn't do anything wrong. Why would they be slaves? They didn't do anything wrong. Children very often bought their parents' freedom. You could marry a slave. A slave could own property. Yes, do your homework. It was only in America when the American government came in and said, no, you are black, therefore you are an animal. You are therefore an animal and therefore we can breed you and your children are now slaves. That's the difference that the others didn't deal with. So all of a sudden now, when things are tough and bad and hard, what did the Jewish community do? What did the Italian community do? What did the Irish community do? They fell back to their old country culture, which most people do. They had their own enclaves. They fell back to support. People often, religion or culture, people, humans do that. What do black people do? Well, we don't know because our culture was ripped from us. We don't know what tribe we came from in Africa. Our culture was destroyed. Now, similar to Native Americans, but many Native Americans still knew what tribe they were from, and some of the tribes weren't completely wiped out. So some of them were able to reconnect. Not all. Some Native Americans follow that same, that same pattern as us. But we have that. So what did our culture became? It became a slave culture because we were slaves. It became a poor culture because we were poor. So black culture is often linked to poverty or slavery. Why? What else were we going to have? What else? Why do we create Kwanzaa as a desperate reason to try to get back together to something that we lost? Of course. That's an issue that we deal with. So of course you move towards that. But now you move eventually in the 60s towards using government. Okay, I got you. You want to use government now. What was the backlash? The war on drugs. The backlash from ending uh, slavery was, was apartheid, Jim Crow. The, the, background, the backlash ending that was in the war on drugs. The war on drugs was meant to crush black, black, um, black, black and, um, and brown communities. And that's what it does. What, what, what been doing Larry, 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 right there really quickly. I am always stunned, absolutely stunned by people on the right who seem so offended by the idea that systemic racism exists. And I always yep. look at the war on drugs and I say, what is that? I mean, everything yes. that the government does is systemic. Like, if that's not yes. systemic racism, what is that? But it's, it's treated as if this idea is the conceptual property of the left, so much so that people can stare something like the war on drugs and the total fraud that it is in its face and say, oh, yep. that's that's not systemic racism. Totally is. And anyway, you, know, I, I, you, I, can, you can look at Nixon. He literally said his words. We want to destroy the black community, put their people in jail. The Black Panther Party, the original Black Panther Party of the 60s, not the one today, the one of the 60s, was all about growing the community. That's why they armed themselves. They created their own schools. They were literally, and again, if you think I'm making this up to your own homework, they were literally murdered by government agents, shot to death in their beds. Literally murdered. That didn't happen to the Irish Americans or the Italian Americans or the Jewish Americans. The government didn't come in and murder all their leaders. That didn't happen. It didn't exist. It's a difference. It's a difference. Okay, so what, what I hear a lot of people say, though, is that, okay, yeah, that's true, but we're talking about history. Uh, you know, Dave Rubin, you know, said, this is the least racist country in the world. You're focusing on the past, Larry. That's those are forms of institutional racism that existed in the past. And and now by by talking about that, you're reinforcing a victim narrative that is holding black people I don't, back. With, I, oh, you hardly ever hear me talk about this. I talk about this when people ask me, but I never leave with yeah. this stuff because it doesn't matter. You're right. He's right. I don't want to focus on this. The difference is when people sort of tell me you don't have to end the war on drugs just because drugs are bad. That's the reason? That's a lie. Stop lying. Mm -hmm. Except that the war on drugs is racist. The war on drugs literally creates a racist system. Cops, when they come in, are no more or less racist than anybody else. I'm not anti-cop. My father was in law enforcement. But here's the reality. Because of the war on drugs, because of civil asset forfeiture, because of the way, in this case, Democrats created more cops in the world, what most people don't know is when Clinton decided to say, we're going to put 100,000 cops in the streets, he didn't pay for it except after, for, after two years. After two years, he stopped paying for it. So states that find money to pay for those cops. So what they do? Civil asset forfeiture. Let's go in and take it. We will now hunt 
in the right places to pay for all these cops, to pay for all these things. Well, what are you going to hunt? In a gated community? No, of course not. Why? Those people don't carry cash, number one, no cash to take. Number two, they vote. Number three, they donate to people who, uh, who uh, run for office and they're lawyers and know the law. You can't mess with them. That's not a smart place to hunt. Where are you going to hunt? Poor black and brown communities. Well, Larry, so they got arrested years ago. What does that mean? It means now they're all felons, so they can't vote. So that history matters now, doesn't it? Because now they can't vote. Now they're easy prey. Not just that, they all have records, which means if they get arrested again, they're finished. And, they're, and, the, and their life is over. They're also now poor. They can't get jobs. So guess what they can't do? They can't afford bail, which means if they go to jail, they're literally going to sit in Rikers Island for two years, lose their family, friends, and everything. Yes, the history does matter today when that's affecting you. Not just that. You know what the jail's full of? Men without fathers? Where were those fathers? In jail from the war on drugs. Yeah. So that history does now affect us today. But do I lead with that? Of course not. I lead with one important thing. Pull cannabis off the schedule one. That's what I lead with. Because here's the most important piece that's happening right now. All those bad laws I talked about, they always come home to roost. Anti-gun laws were all about black people. Now it affects white people. Now it's a problem. War on drugs, all about black people. Now it affects white people. Now it's a crisis. It wasn't a crisis in 1988-92. What did I get in 92 and 88? What did I get then? What I got, I was alive then. I remember that. My mom's a victim of the drug war. My mom is, is a convicted felon. Or was, she passed away. I know this. What did I get? You know what I got? I got say, just say no. I got mandatory minimums. I got three strikes and you're out. That's what I got as a person of color when the opioid crisis was destroying my communities in the 80s and 90s. Now it's destroying white communities. Crisis. Crisis. Narcan. Crisis. All those bad laws. Again, remember, laws make us racist. We aren't naturally racist. That's what I mean by institutional racism. Does the average person go, I'm going to go be a black person? Of course not. But let me go back to the war on drugs. War on drugs was being fought horribly in poor black and brown communities for decades. You're a cop. You join the uh, uh, academy. You don't join the academy going, I can't wait to kill a black guy. You don't do that. Stop. That's silly to even imagine that. You don't. You join the academy thinking, I want to do better. I want to help people. I watch the TV show. I'm going to be a good cop or whatever. That's why you join the academy. That's why everyone joins the academy. That's why you do that. So you join the academy. You become a cop. Now you're a cop. What do they tell you to do? Go in those communities and do civil asset forfeiture. Oh, yeah, because they're bad drug dealers. They're bad drug dealers. Well, now you spend your entire 10-year career, your first part of your career, hunting in brown and black communities. Everyone you see who's a bad guy is brown or black. What do you start thinking? Everyone who's brown or black is bad. How do you know that? Because not only white cops kill black people, black cops do too. So do Hispanic cops, Asian cops. It's not a racial thing in the police force. It is an us versus them thing. We are training our police force because they are just humans like anybody else. And the example I'll give you is, this is from the 70s. I'll give you an example from the 70s. My father was, uh, was first a cop and then a corrections officer. He had buddies in the police force. One of his buddies was in, stayed in the police force for years and he was an undercover cop. And when he came out, he was walking with me in the Bronx. I grew up in the South Bronx. So we were walking around the Bronx and um, he just got off his undercover for a while and he was on his time off. I, I don't know how it works now, but back then, if you were undercover for X number of years, he would give you some time off before you go back into the regular force, whatever that time was. I don't know. I was probably a kid, probably eight, nine. I forgot how old I was. I was a kid. So we're walking around the Bronx and this guy is pointing his finger at people, announcing their crimes, and he doesn't know who they are. He's totally prejudging them. Yeah, that guy, that guy's a burglar, right? Oh, that guy, he robs cars. Literally just point. And he was black like me. And he was pointing at other people who were black. And this, my neighborhood was heavily black and Puerto Rican at the time. I don't know if it still is, but back then it was it was heavily black and Puerto Rican. So he's pointing at, at, at people who are Puerto Rican black and telling me what their crimes are. He has no idea who they are. He was scarred by that time. He eventually committed suicide. So mm -hmm. the issue I'm bringing up here is the system allows for people who are racist, and there are some, of course, to become monsters, and for people who aren't racist to just turn a blind eye to it or to become apathetic or to be or to act in, in a racist way because the environment tells them to. 
Did I go too far? I'm sorry. You can have me talk on this for an hour. No, man. I, I'm at this point. I'm wondering how I can get you back for like a two hour special because there's so there's so many things I want to get into on this. I want one thing I want to talk about at some point is I want to give it get into your uh, your ideas on the privatization of the police force. Um, I, I continue to be amazed at the degree to which uh, my fellow so-called free market lovers just don't really talk about this so much. Um, we, we tend to but, agree. But if you remember, I put together market. a plan on this. And, and the plan was the idea of, again, I don't want to just abolish police or defund police. I think that's a bad idea without a plan. And the plan is you now reorg the police to allow for a heavy community background, a heavy community presence. As you organize for heavy community presence, community, remember, anytime you remove government, you must either you must either add commerce or you must add community. If you don't, you create a power vacuum, right? So whenever you remove government, you've got to add commerce and or community. So as you create, you 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 reset the police to, for, with a heavy community um, component, and now you allow local communities to now up or turn dial up or dial back that community amount, which allows you within different arenas to now begin to by default privatize different areas of the police force. It's a systematic change, a thought process change, not a tomorrow will hire private security. Man, Larry, let me get I this last one in. Ah, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, brother. <laughs> I, you know, I think for people who, a, a lot of black folks that I know, um, I think looking back at history, have a sour taste of capitalism. Don't really believe in capitalism. Sure. Um, think, think it, see all the wrong things, um, and see why it won't work. And I think you know because it hasn't worked. From the right, to you talk, yeah, that we really haven't had free market capitalism. We haven't had, and we haven't allowed the black community to kind of function without intervention, without government intervention, either suppressing or kind of derailing. Uh, you know, the community efforts or similar physically to, burning. Exactly. And so what, you know, how yes. would you, how would you kind of, how, how would you talk to black people or to black America and, and, you know, get them to give capitalism a second chance or at least the free market capitalism that yep. you think is beneficial. Let me, let me touch a couple of things. For those of you who want more information, you can go to my, um, my YouTube page if you want to. I did a about a 45 minute presentation at the University of Columbia, Columbia University about four years ago on the war on drugs and the war on terror. If you wanna check it out, it's about 45 minutes. YouTube, Larry Sharp, University of Columbia, war on drugs, war on terror. You can watch it if you want to. I also did uh, about an hour and a half on poverty at Queens College, it's about a year and a half ago. I discussed everything I'm gonna talk about right now on poverty. It's about, a, again, Larry Sharp, Queens College, you'll, you'll, it'll pop up on YouTube. I also did a Juneteenth special which covers what I talked about, the racism that I talked about, institutional racism from back in the 1600s until now. And that's a Juneteenth special. That's at my Sharp Way YouTube page. Put in Larry Sharp, Juneteenth special. That's about an hour and a half on that also, if you want to. So for those of you interested, please feel free. I've got tons of information on this if you, if you care about it. But now to answer your question, it's all about ownership. Ownership mentality is the issue. What the black community has not had, what other communities have had, is the ability to transfer wealth through their families, right? Obtain ownership, equity in land, in businesses, in everything, ownership mentality. We've lost it because all the people who've been owners in our society, many of them do one of two things, packed up and left the hood, just walked away, or literally been crushed by government. One of those two. And sometimes, I mean, literally lynched. There was a reason why George Floyd's death was so horrible. He was publicly choked to death. That's called the lynching. What would happen is when there was an uppity black man and he was doing something well and white people were upset, what would they do? They would grab the most powerful black man in the town or village and they would publicly lynch him. Now, remember, when people are hanged, the knot is here when people are hanged, when they're killed and hanged, right? They're not as here. Why? The bottom drops out, neck snaps, they die. It's relatively a relatively painless, humane death, right? When they're lynched, the knot's in the back. They suffocate, they choke to death. And it's publicly. It is painful and horrible and terrible. And they kick and scream. And it's the most powerful black man in the community. Someone can watch and go, oh my God, we have no chance of success. It is soul crushing. That's done 
purposefully. And if you're old enough to remember this, I wasn't, my father was. He remembers this. It is done purposely to destroy the community, to crush all hope. That's the goal. Remember, people don't rebel because they're oppressed. People stay oppressed for decades, for centuries. People rebel once there's hope. So if we crush hope, there's no rebellion. So let's choke to death publicly the most powerful black man in the community, and that'll, that'll put, put that away. And it works. And it did work. That's why they did it. It was effective. That was the issue. So how do I change that? Well, that doesn't happen now anymore. I'm sorry. Public lynching doesn't happen now like, like that anymore. What do we do? We want to get back to an ownership mentality. The problem is our culture as a whole, again, all these bad ideas that start in the black community are now coming to roost in every place. Our entire culture is going towards a rental mentality. We don't own our TV. We don't own our beds. We don't own this. We pay monthly for this. We pay monthly for that. We're becoming a renter's mentality for everything that we do. We have to get the black community to understand what a, what a good market does is create ownership. Ownership in my job, ownership in my company, ownership in my land, ownership in my property. Ownership is what makes us care. Ownership is what makes us want to grow. Ownership is what makes us think about a future, what to get next. Ownership is what makes us think I can bring something down to my children, to my kids, to my cousin, to my niece, to my nephew. So what am I offering you? I'm offering you an ownership mentality. And those are policies like, and there are many of them, but one of them is people in public housing allow them the opportunity to purchase their house, to purchase your apartment. Gentrification goes away. What does that mean? Gentrification is a big deal. I hear it all the time. Who hates gentrification? Renters do. But if you're an owner, you don't hate gentrification. You love it. So give people in public housing an opportunity to own the house, to purchase it, to become owners. If all of a sudden you're an owner in the house, what happens? You start caring about that house more. How do I know this? They tried this in London. It worked perfectly. Not just that. You decide on gentrification. If you own the house, you rent it to who you want to rent it to. You can give it to your cousin or your sister or your kid or the, the new cool, trendy white kid from Portland. I don't care who you want to give it to. It's up to you. You rent it to whoever you want to rent it to. You sell to who you want to sell it to. Sell to. You now gain something from it. Not just paying to survive. You're having an ownership mentality. What the market can do well is encourage the black community to own things, own businesses. You see it right now. You go to black communities. What do you find in black communities? Franchises owned by people who don't live there. It's a common thing. Owned by people who don't live there. Being worked at by family members, not even a local black community. Larry, we out of time, man, but this has been such a riveting conversation and I, and I hope we can get you back in the future, man, because we have follow-ups for just about everything you said. This was very uh, thought-provoking, um, entertaining thing, man. Where can the people get more of you? Absolutely. Uh, do whatever you can to come see me on either YouTube, um, Twitter, or Facebook. You can check out The Sharp Way, which you will see behind me, obviously. I'm pumping it, The Sharp Way. Or you can also head over and see, uh, just Google Larry Sharp. I'm, I'm everywhere. And All right. Thanks so much e, for joining us. Larry. And the E stands for entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry. For everybody else tuning in, I will see you tomorrow at TK's Two Cents, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Peace out, everybody.